Good afternoon. Well, my name is Ned Doherty, and I'm the author of Fast Lane to Heaven. And I say that with all humility. I was not a writer or an author before I began to write this book back in January of 95. This book came to me totally by inspiration as a result of an experience that I had on the evening of July 2nd, 1984. As a result of that experience and several spiritual transformative experiences after that, I became, became involved in the study of life after death and the study and research into near-death experiences. I sat on the board of directors of the International Association for Near-Death Studies for several years. So I come to you this afternoon, not only as an experiencer, but someone who has been involved in research into the area of life after death and near-death study issues. To quote the French novelist Marcel Proust, we say that the hour of death cannot be forecast, but when we say this, we imagine that hour as placed in some obscure and distant future. It never occurs to us that it has any connection with the day already begun, or that death, our own death, could arrive this very afternoon, this afternoon that is so certain and which has every hour otherwise filled in advance. These are very unsettling words from Marcel Proust, who died one day in 1922, presumably on a day where every other hour in his day was otherwise filled in advance. These words are most unsettling for those of us who are still living in fear of death. My mission this afternoon, if I am to be successful, is for you to leave here with the comforting knowledge and understanding that we have no reason to fear our own death. I say this with certainty as a result of what I experienced on that evening of July 2nd, 1984. Now before I take you back to that evening, I'd like to tell you a little about the kind of person that I was at the time. And many of you would have described me as a hedonistic, materialistic nightclub owner, because that's what I was. Although I had been raised Catholic, I was probably an atheist. I didn't believe in an afterlife. I didn't even believe in the concept of God. As a matter of fact, in my arrogant world, I thought I was God. My motto was, he who dies with the most toys wins. And I had my share of toys. I owned two highly successful nightclubs, Club Marrakesh in the Hamptons, in Long Island, New York, and in Palm Beach, Florida. I had a luxury home in the Hamptons and apartments in New York City and Palm Beach. I owned a Mercedes-Benz convertible. Otherwise, I traveled by private jet, seaplane, helicopter, and limousine. I dined in the finest and trendiest restaurants with sports personalities and celebrities, many names that you would know. I had all the money, power, prestige, and women that a single guy in his 30s could even dream about. I thought I really had it made living in this fast lane until that night of July 2nd, when frankly I had an experience that humbled my arrogance. Now to take you back to that evening, suffice it to say at this point that I was involved in an altercation with a business associate in my nightclub in West Hampton Beach. I was the assailant and he was the victim. My own security people had pulled me off of him. Now, I wasn't physically injured, but I found myself hyperventilating out of control. I couldn't catch my breath. And I went outside and stumbled into an alleyway trying to breathe. And the harder I tried to breathe, the less oxygen I was getting. And I realized I was really in trouble. And I thought, this could be it. This is how it all ends. And I saw a friend of mine walking down the alleyway toward me. And just as I went to breathe in to call out for help, I felt my lungs collapse, my heart stopped beating, and inexplicably I looked up into the night sky for help as my head exploded. My body fell to the sidewalk, but then it seemed as if a hole opened up under the sidewalk because I kept falling down 
in a vivid state of consciousness, detached from my physical body. I was free falling in darkness. And at a certain point, after it was completely dark in this horrible place I found myself in, I began to be covered into what I would later describe as a black bottomless pit. Now this was the first of a number of terms and phrases that I would later use to describe this experience that actually came from the Bible. And because I had been raised Catholic, I had no knowledge of the Bible. Now indeed, my body was lying on that sidebar. When my friend came over and kneeled down, I was not breathing, I had no pulse, no heartbeat. Several policemen arrived and they radioed for an ambulance. The ambulance happened to be one block away and arrived very quickly. And they performed what is known as a scoop and run. They got my body into the ambulance and they began to work in the parking lot because at that time they had no vital signs and they weren't sure whether or not they were going to the hospital or going to call the coroner. But of course, I was in another place in another realm. And in this black bottomless pit where I found myself detached from my physical body, I was free of emotion or any kind of physical pain at that point. All I had was this vivid state of consciousness and the only thought that I could emote to myself was that I am, I am, I am, I am. And I kept repeating it to myself as if it was my heartbeat or my pulse that would allow me to continue to exist. And I felt that if I stopped saying I am, that I would have simply ceased to exist. And at that point, that was a very frightening concept to me. Now, just prior to this experience, I thought when life is over, the party's over, lights out, that's it. And that was fine with me. But now I wanted to survive. And what happened was that I realized, and in retrospect, that there's something spiritually great ingrained inside of me, as it is ingrained in all of us. That that moment of darkness, when we see no other options, no other choices, there's only one choice, only one option that comes to us. And I began to think about God, my God and my Creator. And as soon as I began to think about Him, I began to float up out of this black bottomless pit. I was floating up very slowly. And all of a sudden, I found myself sitting up. And as I sat up, I heard a voice behind me say, I have no vitals, we're losing him. And I realized I was sitting in an ambulance, and there was an EMT who was kind of working through me, and I didn't quite understand this. So I went to turn around to see what was going on, and suddenly I found myself floating over these EMTs as they were working on my body on the gurney. I was very detached and disinterested in it. And I heard the driver of the ambulance announce over a two-way radio that the patient had just coded. And as he did so, he accelerated the ambulance. And at that point, all of a sudden, I found myself floating up and out and over the roadway. And now I'm watching the ambulance going down this dark two-lane road in this forested area. And I'm just hovering there over the road. I went to get my bearings, and the first thing I noticed was my Rolex watch was missing. And I looked back down at that ambulance and I thought, those guys just sold my Rolex watch. I used much words, worse words than that. And I was really getting angry. I noticed my physical body was missing, but that didn't bother me. I wanted that Rolex watch. That was one of my prized possessions. And nobody took anything away from me that was mine. And with that thought, I suddenly had, now in this audience you've heard of a life review, I had an inventory review, a property review. <laughs> and what I saw in front of me visually was all of my important things, not my friendships or family or loved ones. I saw all the things that were important to me go by and then implode into nothingness, and it started with the Mercedes Benz convertible. And then the real estate and the homes and the nightclubs and all of my toys all the way back to my youth. I finally watched my Lionel trains. And when I was five years old, going around the track, 
aircraft, and all of a sudden they were imploded into nothingness. And then I had the sense of knowingness. I don't need to describe that to many of you who have had NDEs. I knew that all the things that were important in my life were being taken away from me. And then inexplicably, as I looked up into the night sky, I thought, I'm going home. And at that point, all of a sudden, everything in front of me began to churn in a counterclockwise motion, like a field of energy, like a dark ocean wave, churning over and turning. And I suddenly found myself looking into this vortex of energy. And I was absolutely mesmerized as I'm looking into this vortex. And suddenly, this blue ethereal being begins to develop. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at a friend of mine who I never expected to see again because he had been killed in Vietnam. And he simply said to me, everything is okay. And he asked me to come along with him. And I heard this whooshing noise as we entered this vortex of energy. And then very melodious sounds. I could hear crystals and chimes. And all of a sudden we were out in the universe. And I went to turn around to see from where I came. And as I looked back, I could see the earth was not that big. It was just another speck out in the universe. And when I turned around again, all of a sudden it seemed as if the sun just came up and, and enveloped me. But it wasn't the sun. I was enveloped in this loving, radiant, beautiful light. And I felt my spiritual being absorbing this loving energy and this light. Now in my book, for several pages, I try to describe what it's like being in this light in their death research, I sat with many other people and listened to their stories, and I've read many accounts. And I have to tell you that we have all failed miserably in trying to describe the ineffable. There's only one to describe, word to describe it. It is ineffable. The experience of being in the presence, in my belief, I was in the presence and enveloped and loved by my God and my Creator. And I understood that I was still loved by him despite my transgressions, despite the life I had been leading. And as questions came to my mind, they were answered. And my first question was answered in this way, that I had been set upon this earthly life on a positive path of learning and growth, but that I had strayed off onto a negative path, and I became addicted to alcohol, to drugs, to sex and material possessions. And I realized that I had been rescued from the life I had been leading, that I had a mission in life, and that I would return to my life. And as I had this understanding, I felt that I was being imbued not only with this love of God, this eternal, unfathomable love, but I was also receiving knowledge and I actually felt that I was craving this knowledge that I was receiving. It was knowledge about the universe. It was knowledge that I needed to have when I returned to perform my mission in life. At one point, I remember asking God to know more about Him, more about the universe, and more about it, all this information I was receiving. And His response to me was, you will have an eternity to learn more of me and about me. Now, I was in this loving presence of God for perhaps a nanosecond of time, perhaps an eternity. It is another ineffable problem trying to describe time in that realm because time and space, as we know it here, has no meaning on the other side. Now, for the rest of the experience, I would like you to think back the last time you had a very vivid dream, and in that dream, you were in a particular dream sequence with particular people, and all of a sudden, without any transition, you were in another sequence with other people, and each of these experiences was just as vivid, and you can remember them. It would have to be a very recent dream for you to be able to remember this. I am the 
describing an experience that took place 17 years ago. And I can remember every part of that experience in detail. Now, when the first transition came, I was suddenly floating down with my friend still at my side. We were still out in the universe, and we were in the celestial amphitheater, as I described in my book. And as we floated down, and I looked out, I saw all my spiritual brothers and sisters, and they were all greeting me with waves of energy. And I realized, indeed, this was my home. These were my brothers and sisters. And when I looked up to the right side, very close to me, I saw family members and friends and loved ones who had passed on before me. And they greeted me more closely. And indeed, this was my home. These were my spiritual brothers and sisters. This was the perfect family that I had always longed for in my life. The experience was like being at every birth, every birthday, every graduation ceremony, every wedding, every reunion, every celebration in a perfect family. Because that's where I was, and that's what I was experiencing. And then suddenly, the assembly became quiet. And I found myself stepping forward, just one space. And as I did so, all of a sudden, I was enveloped in what I would describe as a crystalline sphere. It was a crystalline sphere of virtual reality. And in this virtual reality, I began to witness a review of my life in complete detail. It started at my earliest infancy. And in my book, I describe many painful and personal experiences that were part of that life review. But in the short period of time that we have here, I want to concentrate on what I thought was the most important lesson that I learned during that life review. And that had to do with the relationship with my dad. When I was five years old, my mother and I had to flee the apartment we were living in with my dad because of his drinking and his violence. It was after my dad had thrown my mother down the stairs and me with her trying to catch her. And I can remember that I believe I jumped out of my skin as I held on to my mother and kept her from falling further. Well, I was very proud of my mother that night because she walked out and that was the last night for her. But of course he was my dad, and I would seek him out for many years thereafter. My mother moved to New York, and I grew up on East Elm Street in Hazleton, Pennsylvania with my grandmother and my grandmother's home. And I loved living in that home, because there was security and stability there. And although I was very lonely, because I was not with my parents, it's where I nurtured my spiritual life for 12 years while I went to St. Gabriel's School. And during that time, I would see my dad infrequently. It was a neighborhood corner Irish bar where my dad spent the rest of his life. And whenever I walked by that bar, I could always see my dad through the window sitting in the corner of the bar. And sometimes I'd try to walk by when I knew somebody was going to walk, walk in the door, because every time the door opened, my dad would turn around, and then I could see his face as he would greet whoever came through that door. It seemed as if he was waiting for somebody to walk through that door that was going to change his life around for him. And that's the kind of relationship we had for all those 12 years. Yes, we did meet infrequently, and they were always trying meetings because my dad was always drunk. So during those years, I never had the bonding that I wanted to have, that this son wanted to have with his dad. Now, when I graduated from high school, I moved to New York City, and I went to St. John's University. And in my freshman year, I went to a fraternity party because I wanted to belong to that fraternity. And that night, at that fraternity party, although I hated the stench of beer, because every time I passed that bar, it reminded me of the sadness of my dad's life. And even though in that bar and that party last night I hated the stench of beer, I began to drink beer. Why? Because I wanted to be part of that fraternity. I saw this bonding between this group of men that I wanted to be part of. And the next morning I woke up, I looked in the mirror, I looked terrible, I felt physically sick. 
but kind of a miracle happened that night before, because you see, I had this gnawing feeling inside of me from the time I was about five years old. And during that brief drinking, during all that camaraderie and that laughter, that gnawing feeling disappeared. And I thought as I looked in the mirror that maybe there was something about this drinking that I needed to know more about. So several weeks later, I got in a bus and I went back up to Hazleton, Pennsylvania. The bus dropped me off two blocks from that bar, and I walked those two blocks fully knowing that when I opened that door, my dad would be there, and he was. And when I opened the door, he turned around, and he watched me as I sat around the corner of the bar right next to him. The bartender came over, and I ordered a beer for myself, and I said, I'll have a beer for my dad here, too. And he turned and looked at me with very sad eyes, and he said, it sure is good to see you, son. And I felt that gnawing feeling ease inside of me. Well, my dad and I started to talk very slowly that afternoon. We didn't really have much to say to each other. And as we sat and I drank beer with him, that gnawing feeling got, started to go away. It started to disappear. And at a certain point, I noticed that my dad would sit there and he would stare down into his glass of beer with those sad eyes. And he would turn the glass counterclockwise. And he'd do that constantly. And then he would stop turning the glass, and he would drink the whole glass down, and he'd push it across the bar for another beer. And after about two hours, while I sat and drank with him, I finally got up the courage to mention that to him. And I said, I said, well, uh, why do you do that? Uh, you know, you, you sit there, you keep turning your glass around, and he looked down, he realized he was doing it, he stopped. And he picked it up and he drank it down and he pushed it across the bar. And then he told me his story. He said, son, he said, you won't remember this. He said, but when you were about five years old, I wasn't very good to your mother. And one night something terrible happened. And after it happened, I went back to the bar and I sat in there. And I sat there and I turned the glass around in my hand because I wanted to turn back the clock, to turn back the time. I wanted to make that thing not happen. And I thought if I could just turn the glass around, I could have made it not happen, but of course that's not reality and that's not the way things turned out. Now when I first went back to visit my dad in that bar, it was 1964. And for the next 10 years, from 1964 until 1974, I went back and visited my dad in that bar less and less frequently. And finally, by the summer of 1974, I was a successful real estate broker in the Hamptons, very upscale summer resort community for the wealthy people from New York City. I owned two real estate offices. I had a brand new home that I built. Drove a Lincoln Mark IV. That was a big car in those days. I had a pretty girlfriend. My dad never visited me in my home in the Hamptons. He never left that corner bar in Hazleton. And then one morning in the summer of 74, I got a call. My dad was in the hospital. I got in my Lincoln Mark IV. I drove up to Hazleton. I walked in his room, and I realized that I had already lost him. You see, he had advanced cirrhosis of the liver. Dementia had already set in. So I didn't have the chance to say goodbye to my dad to tell him that I loved him. And I buried him several days later. And after I buried him, I went out to Interstate 80. Instead of driving east back to New York, I decided to drive west. I decided I was going to drive all the way to California and get away for a while. And several days later, I was driving across the state of Nebraska, driving in a straight line for miles and miles and hours and hours, passing cornfields. And at a certain point, a new song came on the radio, a song I had never heard before. A song by Harry Chapin called Cats in the Cradle. It's a song about a dad and his son. And it starts out, when are you coming home, dad? I don't know when. But we'll get together then, son. We're going to have a good time then. And then you hear the son saying, I'm going to grow up just like you, dad. You know, I'm going to grow up just like you. And then you hear the dad saying, when are you coming home, son? I don't know when. But we'll have a good time then. And they started to cry real tears for the first time probably since I was five years old. Because I was hearing the story of my life with my dad. And as I was driving down that highway, it seemed like the car took on a life of its own. 
and I looked into the rearview mirror, and I thought I saw the ghost or the spirit of my dad sitting in the back seat, looking very aged and defeated. And as I'm staring into the mirror, looking at him, I heard the very last line and the very last verse of that song not uh, through Harry Chapin's melodious voice, but through the voice of my dad. And that last line was, he's grown up just like me, my boy, he's just like me. And I just stared into that mirror as my dad vanished. And then I shook, and I thought, oh, that was some kind of hallucination, wasn't it? My dad's gone. He's gone forever. I didn't get the message because by the time I got to the Colorado State line, I bought a six-pack of Coors beer my first, and I drank it down in about 20 minutes. I didn't get the message. Ironically, several years later, I opened a nightclub in July 1976 in the Hamptons in New York, and Harry Chapin entertained there one night and he sang that song. But this was a discotheque right at the beginning of the disco era before Studio 54 opened in Manhattan, before Saturday Night Fever. And it was a smashing success from the night I opened that club. And several years later, I opened another club, Marrakesh, in Palm Beach, Florida. And now I'm really living in the fast lane. I'm spending my winters in Palm Beach, my summers in the Hamptons. I'm surrounded by beautiful people from New York, the Hamptons, and Palm Beach. And during my life review, I was shown a scene, a very vivid scene, of the night that happened on March 1st, 1980. It was a Saturday night, time and night that I call the Hour of Critical Mass, beautiful club in Palm Beach. I created it, I promoted it, and it was a smashing success. On that night, as on many nights, I was waiting for the next blonde and beautiful girl to walk through the door who was going to change my life for me. And this night, indeed, a young blonde woman walked up to me and she did change my life for me because she had a gold chain around her neck and the end of that chain was a spoon used for snorting cocaine. So I spent a lot of time with this girl and several thousand dollars and now I was really living in the fast lane. I was part of this cocaine subculture but I'm surrounded by beautiful people in the best places in the world and I'm not realizing the danger that is going on around me. You see, all of my friends were using cocaine. I knew doctors, lawyers, psychiatrists, Wall Street people, models, actors, actresses, a lot of famous people. Everybody was using this new drug. We were all part of this cocaine subculture. And at first, people were passing it around freely, and then people started to sell it. And then the deals got bigger. And then the arrests came, and then the disappearances, in some cases, and the people who were murdered. But hey, I'm living in the fast lane, in beautiful places, with beautiful people, surrounded by all this excitement and intrigue, and I had no idea how dark my life had become. I was spiraling down a dark vortex into a black bottomless pit. And then I was shown during my life review another scene that happened in February of 1983. Again, I was standing in the VIP bar, in the club in Palm Beach. It was a Saturday night, the hour I call, the hour of critical mass, 12.30 at night, lights, the sound, the music, beautiful tan crowd, crowd. It was right after a charity ball had, was over in Palm Beach, and all the wealthy people, the wealthy families from Palm Beach, many names you would know, they were coming over to my club and the Rolls Royces and limousines, the men walking in their tuxedos, the women in gowns with jewelry, I was standing at the bar myself that Saturday night. I had on my custom tailored black tuxedo made of Worth Avenue in Palm Beach, my black Gucci loafers and belt, of course my Rolex watch. I had all the silly trappings that had become so important to be part of this Palm Beach scene. And as I stood there, arrogantly admiring myself and all of my accomplishments, I suddenly had at the time, what I thought was a hallucination. I had this melancholy feeling come over me. I began to think about my dad. And then I thought, I bet if my dad could see me here now, he'd be really proud of me. And with that thought, all of a sudden, a whooshing sound went by me. Everything became silent, and suddenly everything was in slow motion. 
And I didn't see this exciting nightclub filled with beautiful people. What I saw was an X-ray vision. And in that X-ray vision, I saw a place of darkness filled with lost souls. And over my right shoulder and my right ear, I heard the voice of my dad. He's grown up just like me. My boy, he's just like me. And I jumped again. And everything went back to normal. The lights, the sound, the music, the beautiful crowd, the laughter. And I was really shaken up. I thought, ah, okay, I had a hallucination. And I looked down to pick up this glass of Don Perignon champagne, my favorite. And as I looked out at the glass, it was turning counterclockwise in my hand. And I grabbed it and held on. And I drank it down. And I put it down very hard because when I drank Don Perignon down, it tasted bitter. And I told the bartender, give me a bottle of Perignon away, and I drank that, and it tasted bitter. It made me very angry. And from that night, in February of 83, inexplicably, I stopped using cocaine. But I kept on drinking champagne, wine, liquors, anything I could to try to get that old feeling back. You see, every time that I tried to drink, it tasted bitter, and it was making me angry. Alcohol was my best friend, and it was turning against me, and it was making me more and more angry. And from that night, February of 83, until that night of July 2nd, 1984, I kept doing the same thing over and over and over again, and expecting the results to turn out differently. And in 12-step recovery, we call that insanity. And my life had become so insane by that night of July 2nd, 1984, that I was in the act of physically strangling and murdering my business associate when I had been rescued from that experience. And that's how my life review ended. And I again was in that celestial amphitheater, surrounded by, by my spiritual brothers and sisters, and it was very silent and still. Well, why. Diane, let's, when you come back, we'll It's probably too much basin. That might be why I'm getting it. Okay. Love the story, though. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep in mind, I'm still dead now. <laughs> But then there was another transition. And in this next transition, I found myself in a beautiful garden setting. And in this garden setting, I was greeted by a beautiful woman, a beautiful spiritual being, much more beautiful, more radiant, and filled with more energy and light than any of my spiritual brothers and sisters. This beautiful spiritual being became known to me as the Lady of Light. And she waved her arm in this direction. And as she did so, I saw what were glimpses of my future life. But these were scenes that were totally incongruous to the life that I had been leading, and they made no sense. In the first scene, I saw myself standing in a podium in an auditorium. I knew it was in a university, and I saw doctors and researchers sitting there taking notes about what I was talking about. Why would they be listening to this crazy nightclub over up at the podium? That made no sense to me. Then I saw myself walking through the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C. And then I'm standing at a podium and I'm addressing congressmen. I didn't like politics or politicians. What am I doing here? I saw myself sitting at the bedside of sick and dying people, both young and old. And I saw that whatever it was that I was conveying to them was very rewarding for them to hear, but it was also rewarding for me to be there with them. Well, I only like being around beautiful, healthy people, so this didn't make any sense either. I was shown many other future scenes. The ones that I've just described to you have since taken place in my life. I was shown this mountain valley area and what I thought was a country inn. 
in an area that became known to me in Sugarloaf, very near where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And I was told that I was going to start this Mission of Angels Foundation. I was given a mission statement and the goals that were to be achieved by this foundation. And this didn't make any sense either. I was shown many more scenes about my future life. Many have since come true. And many, I believe, are still in the future of my life. And then there was another transition. And I suddenly found myself in a magnificent structure. A magnificent structure made of ethereal marble, if you will. And in this place, the Lady of Light was standing across from me, and between us was a large globe of planet Earth. And she began to speak to me very softly, and as she did so, she began to point out to planet Earth. And I saw flash points of light break out in the Middle East, and then in Europe and Northern Africa, and all of a sudden flash points of light broke out all through the Middle East, and then into Far East, into Asia, into Russia, and to China. And during the same sequence, I saw these visions of future events that were supposedly going to take place. And these were very terrifying visions. And I'd like to go to my book right now to quote from what I was inspired to write from what I saw of those visions. When the Lady of Light first began to speak to me about the future of the world, I was shown that major events would happen first in the Middle East and then in Italy. I was told that these events would be acts of aggression, terrorism, and war performed by self-proclaimed radical groups, supposedly in the name of God. Number two, I believe that a terrorist-type attack will occur in the future in Italy specifically in Rome. I believe that a fanatical religious group on a much larger scale will conduct the attack, although it will be directed against one world leader. The focus of the attack will be upon the Vatican and the papacy. And indeed, within the last several weeks, news releases have come out, and according to the, the primary source, the head of Vatican security, the number one target of the Osama bin Laden al-Qaeda network is the Pope in the Vatican. Number three, terrorist attacks and acts of war and aggression will continue to plague the Middle East, Africa, and Europe as evidenced by the ethnic cleansing in Eastern Europe in the former Yugoslavia. Many of these acts will be performed by religious fanatical terrorist organizations supposedly in the name of God but the Lady of Light told me that these acts of terrorism and war were never part of God's plan. In reality, these acts of aggression and war are the products of evil men who are motivated by power and greed, not love of God. They use God and religion as a cover to enforce their diabolical plans, to ferment political turmoil, and to enslave and control others. Number four. Wars and rumors of war will continue to plague the Eastern Hemisphere, spreading from the Middle East into Africa and Europe, and then to countries of the former Soviet Union and to the Far East, particularly China. Number five, the greatest threat to global peace and preservation will come from China, which is preparing itself for global war and domination by building the largest army in the world, prophetically referred to in the book of Revelations as the army of 200 million. The Lady of Light specifically told me, pray for the conversion of China. The conversion of China to God is necessary for the salvation of the world. Number six, while acts of terrorism and war and political unrest plague the Eastern Hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere will be spared the worst of the terrorism. However, a major terrorist attack may befall New York City or Washington, D.C., severely impacting the way we live in the United States. <coughs> Number seven, the Western Hemisphere will be plagued mainly by natural disasters, freakish, erratic, 
and unseasonable weather patterns will create severe tidal flooding and land erosion. There will be devastating tornadoes and windstorms, severe winter conditions with record snowfalls and freezing temperatures, record summer heat waves with severe drought, and an increase in destructive storms and hurricanes. And the list goes on. Now needless to say, everything that I was shown about the Middle East, including the events of September 11th, have since come true. I was shown scenes regarding these geophysical changes as well as the geopolitical changes. Unseasonable weather patterns, for example. And last January, when I was in Washington, D.C., there was a lead article in the Washington Post. Scientists issue dire warning about the future. And ironically, this was a United Nations conference in Beijing, China, that came out and released a report about all of the weather changes that are going to take place as a result of global warming within the next hundred years. The same scientists ten years ago were saying, in the next thousand years, I still beg to differ with them, it will be in the next several decades. But what they described in this report, these scientists, as to what these changes were going to be, they're the same as what I described in my book on future visions. This nightclub owner, when he was clinically dead in an ambulance in 1984, saw and reported the same things from that experience that the scientists are now reporting. But most importantly, what the Lady of Light told me is none of these geophysical or geopolitical changes, these dire changes, need take place if mankind began to recognize and work with God's plan. And the way to work with God's plan was through prayer and meditation, through prayer to call out to God, and through meditation to hear His message. The Lady of Light showed me a wonderful, promising future. And in those visions, that new future for this world did not come from the actions or the decisions of the power brokers or politicians in the world. It came from people in prayer. People forming groups of prayer and prayer groups throughout the world and praying for a better world began to send out positive energy into the spiritual atmosphere that surrounds this world. And by the positive energy created by the power of prayer, the terrible things that I was shown could be alleviated, postponed, or canceled. And then a lady of light took me back to that beautiful garden setting again. And from that garden setting, there was a magnificent man sitting there. And he conveyed messages to me also. That magnificent man who you who've read my book would recognize as Jesus. And during this part of the experience, I saw, first of all, the spirits of the children who were intended to be my children in this life. But because I thought of children as inconveniences, they had not been born. And then I saw this little blue-eyed, blonde-haired boy. He was being treated somewhat differently than the other children. He was being protected, first by the Lady of Light, and then by Jesus, as he was being shown to me. And although I didn't plan on having any children in my life, I inexplicably asked the Lady of Light, is he to be my son? And she said, truly, he is a son of God, as are all God's children, the sons and daughters of God. And then that scene began to expand. And beyond that garden setting, I again saw this mountain valley area in northeastern Pennsylvania, where I was told that much of my future would be. And I saw scenes during a period of time that became known to me as the end times. And I understood that the end times did not mean the end of the world. It meant the end of the world as we know it. And indeed, on 911, didn't the world end as we know it? Didn't we all interiorly change on that very morning? None of us here is the same today as we were on 9 10. 
And what I was shown during these end times was that there was going to be a global spiritual transformation that was going to take place. And indeed, by 912, didn't we see it happen? Signs all over America, even on public buildings, where God isn't even allowed to be talked about. You saw signs, God bless America. And people went back to their houses of worship. People met in prayer. Groups of prayer were formed around the world. And in that worship and in that prayer, beams of light were sent out into that spiritual atmosphere to counterbalance all of the negative energy that mankind has been pouring out into that spiritual atmosphere for centuries. I understood that God was going to put a protective mantle around the earth during these times. And that we all individually and as a civilization could call upon God to call upon that spiritual energy, especially when we were in prayer, especially when we were doing loving acts, especially when we had love of God, love of self, love of neighbor, and especially when we were of service to mankind. And I saw that this positive energy that we would create, this positive energy was going to change the world for the better. And I was shown scenes of earth during this period of time, scenes where I saw that God's Holy Spirit was manifested more fully in everything in nature. I saw in this mountain and valley area how everything had become so much more vibrant. And I saw indeed a future for planet Earth where we live more in what was like heaven on Earth. And when that scene ended, although I realized we would go through a dire period of geopolitical changes and geophysical changes, Indeed, in the future of planet Earth, we would see heaven on Earth. I saw the dates 1998 to 2001 as the period of transition and change. And I was shown scenes that ended in the year 2034. Not that the world ended in the year 2034, but I was shown scenes up to and including that year. And I'm very hopeful and very excited about everything that I had been shown about the future. And then there was another transition. I was again back in that celestial amphitheater with my spiritual brothers and sisters. My friend was again at my side. And they were bidding me farewell, again in waves of energy. And as they did so, I began to move back with my friend at my side. And all of a sudden, we were out in the universe out in darkness among the stars, and then we began to float down gently. And I realized that we were floating down in Elm Street, and I'm looking up at my grandmother's home at night. And for the first time during this experience, my friend turns toward me, and he said, we are back on planet Earth now, and you will be going back to from where you came. But I brought you here first. And he pointed to my grandmother's home, and he said, because I wanted you to remember who you were when you lived in this home, and how spiritually connected you were when you lived here. You must remember everything that you experienced, because you have very important work to do, and you are going to go back now. And he began to bid me farewell. And as he did so, I began to float back. And at first, I was still filled with that love of God, and I floated back slowly, but all of a sudden, that love began to ebb away from me. And all of a sudden, I was floating faster and faster. And then I was free-falling in darkness. Falling, falling down very fast. And all of a sudden, I was slammed back into my physical body. I felt this tremendous jolt of electricity through my chest. And I let out this primordial scream. It was the most painful experience of my existence. I would learn later that no one in the ambulance heard that scream. It was a spiritual scream from my spirit that for that brief period of time had been floating free on the other side and now I was trapped back in this physical body and I didn't want to be there. And I blacked out into unconsciousness in that ambulance as it sped off to the hospital. And later on I would learn, according to the ambulance records and interviews, 
that I had coded in that ambulance for a period of eight minutes when they believed that they had lost me and I was gone. It was only through the efforts of one of the EMTs that decided to keep working on me that I was brought back. But as I said, I didn't want to be there. Now I'd like to take a break. How's that, okay? And, uh, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, and I'll tell you the rest of my story when we come back, okay? Thank you very much. I was a uh, wheeled into this hospital on a gurney. This was a country hospital in the east end of Long Island. It was during July 4th week at night, and it was one of those nights in an emergency room when all hell is broken loose. Um, when I was brought in, I was immediately uh, attended to by physicians, and uh, finally stabilized. I was wheeled into an intensive uh, care area. And just after I was brought in, there were several uh, head-on accidents and uh, some victims being brought in, and they were short of help in the emergency room. So the driver of the ambulance uh, was told to stay with me in this curtained-off area. And later on, I would interview this uh, ambulance driver, who's now a policeman in the town of South Hampton, East of Long Island. And when I interviewed him, this is what he told me. He said, uh, he said, they left me alone with you for about 15, 20 minutes. And he said, and while I was there, he said, all of a sudden, you went again. And he said, I had to bring you back. And he said, you went again, and I brought you back. And you went again, and I had to bring you back. And each time, I was trying to get help, and I couldn't because there was no one else to help me. So he said, the whole time that I was working on you, trying to bring you back, I just had this feeling that you didn't want to come back. <laughs> yes, said, really? At a certain point, after all the physiological tests were conducted, the head nurse came over to my bedside with a clipboard in hand. She reached out to take my pulse, and I grabbed her by the arm very tight, and wouldn't let go. And in semi comatose state, I was mumbling, I love you, and God loves you, and God loves everyone, and you must tell them that they're loved by God. Well, this nurse, she's seen just about everything. Here she has a nightclub owner, Catholic apparently lapsed, picked up outside his nightclub. He's in respiratory and or cardiac arrest for over an hour, coded for a period of eight minutes in the ambulance. The physiological tests could not come up with a diagnosis to explain what had happened to me. But based on what this nurse was hearing, she figured I must have been on drugs. So I was given a test for drug overdose. And when that test came back, it came back negative. And then the doctors were really perplexed because they could not come up with a diagnosis. So they performed a second more elaborate set of drug tests. And after I'd been laying in the hospital for several days in pain and complained that I wanted something to relieve me of that pain, they found out several days later that indeed I was not on drugs. And as I told you, I stopped using any drugs, either illegal or legal, since February of 1983. And in retrospect, why? Because I was being prepared for that night. But as I was laying in that hospital, knowing full well that they didn't have a physiological diagnosis, I was troubled by that. But I was over also troubled by this powerful experience that I just could not erase from my mind, although I wanted to, because it was demanding too much of me, too much of my future. It altered my entire perception of who I thought I had been very briefly for the past 20 years when I was pursuing my materialistic, hedonistic lifestyle. But I kept asking them for something for the pain, but I couldn't be very specific about what the pain was, because if I honestly said that every nerve fiber, every nerve ending in my body feels like it's a flame from 
my spirit being trapped back into the gorilla suit. Because if I said something like that, I thought for sure they would take me to the psychiatric ward. Because that night when I was finally coming out of that semi-comatose state, the first thing I remember that head nurse saying was, if you don't stop talking that nonsense about God, we're going to call a psychiatrist in here. So I shut up. I knew I was not in some heavenly way station where I initially thought they were going to extract my spirit back out of this gorilla suit and I was going to be able to fly free again. Indeed, I was in an emergency room in a hospital, wired up, trapped in this physical body. After several days in the hospital, a doctor came in and uh, after he determined that I hadn't been on drugs and I'd been complaining about the pain, his response was, he wasn't on any drugs. You better put him on drugs now. <laughs> Intravenous 10 milligrams of Valium, and I was floating back into the heavens, but in a different way. <laughs> and what I didn't know at the time, as many of you know, is that those of us who come back from a very profound NDE uh, are very hypersensitive to any kind of alcohol or drugs or stimulants, and certainly I was. But during this period in the hospital, I was having very profound flashbacks. And backs. It was like I, I had a VHS cassette in my head. I could flash forward and back and reverse, and I can remember this experience in detail, and I kept doing that. Dr. Keenan, one morning just before I was being released, he seemed quite confident that he came up with a diagnosis. Sat down with the clipboard going over all these pages, and he's just shaking his head because nothing there made sense, and all of a sudden, he started asking me questions. Were you in the military service? Well, yeah, I was in the Army Reserves, but very briefly. He said, did you serve in Vietnam? I said, no. I didn't want to go any further with that. I knew what was coming next. Well, during the night, the nurses say you were waking out of fitful nightmares, and you seemed to be reliving some experience that you had in Vietnam. Well, what I couldn't tell a doctor was, indeed, I had been reliving my friends experience in Vietnam right up until the moment of the explosion when he had been killed. Because again, if I started telling him that, I wouldn't have been discharged. I would have been sent into the psychiatric ward. So I really couldn't talk about that. The doctor was very disappointed that I hadn't served in Vietnam. And then he said, he said, well, uh, I thought perhaps you were suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, something that seems to be quite common these days for men who had served in Vietnam. And I said to him, well, what is it exactly? And he said, well, uh, I, I'm not really sure myself. I just read about it in Time magazine. <laughs> okay, I'm getting some answers here now. <laughs> so when I left that hospital, I went out with a, I left without a physiological diagnosis, but as I said, now I'm concerned about this more powerful event that happened to me. I went home and I, I would lie out on my chase lounge next to the pool in my secluded contemporary Playboy estate. And I would sit there and I would take drops of water and let them fall off my finger and I was absolutely mesmerized by a drop of water. I remember I sat with a ladybug, my new friend on my finger. I was enthralled with the beauty of this ladybug. I would look at a tree or a leaf or a flower in my hand, absolutely enthralled with the beauty in nature. I would lie out there at night looking up at the stars and dreaming about going home. The first chance I had to leave the house, I went shopping. I went out and bought about a dozen different chimes and I hung them all over the trees out in my pool area. And I went into this woo-woo new age store and I was drawn to buy these tapes, tapes of the strange sounding music. So now I'm lying out at the chase lounge at night, I'm listening to the strange music, trying to make connections. The sounds that I heard during my experience, and I can't wait in the evening for the breezes to start up, because then the chimes start up, and I'm almost like recreating and thinking about, they're going to come back, I'm going to go home, I'm trying to create this opportunity to leave again, beat me up, Scotty, you know? <laughs> Pretty crazy behavior for a nightclub owner. And one day I got up the courage to walk back down to the main street of the village where my nightclub was. It was on a bright sunny day. 
I walked back into that alleyway and I stood at the spot, like a village that you staring down at that spot where my body had dropped that night. And as I was staring down at that spot and thinking about this experience I had, I remember the children going by me, running by me, eating ice cream cones, several of the Hamptons ladies, LV bags, too much makeup, jewelry, complaining about the prices. And as I'm staring down at that spot, all of a sudden I hear a voice, the voice of a lady in white. And I hear, you are going to write a book about what you experienced. And this book will become a source of inspiration for people in search of their true spiritual nature. Well, I look around, and of course, there's no lady of light. There's kids eating ice cream cones. Women still standing there complaining about the prices. It's a beautiful sunny day in the Hamptons, and I'm hearing voices. And I knew at that very moment that I had to do something about what I was experiencing. Now, many of you understand that term being drawn to drawn to certain people, places, certain things, certain <coughs> geographical locations. My brain was thinking differently. The image of what it calls it the brain shift. I had the brain shift. I saw auras around people. I saw negative energy. When people tried to talk to me, I was having a one-way conversation. I was reading their thoughts and answering. I was getting them very upset. And getting me very upset because I was seeing like I was just being filled with all this information because I'm thinking their thoughts. It was making me really crazy. I was drawn to go to Duke University Medical Center. I heard that from a soft voice. It made no sense. I'm 60 miles from New York City. Great medical centers there. Of course I wanted answers to this physiological problem. I was trying to drink again. Every time I tried to drink, I would start passing out. I would get dizzy. I couldn't drink at all. So I went to the University Medical Center. Probably so I could start drinking. <laughs> and when I got there with my records, I was assigned a primary physician. I took my Blue Cross Blue Shield card. They started bringing that baby up. They put me through every conceivable physiological test that the Medical Center could come up with trying to come up with a diagnosis that the that country hospital could not come up with. And after about two weeks of this testing, they came up with nothing. I very courageously asked for a psychiatric evaluation. I'm looking for answers, but I was very cautious about where to look for them. Again, that voice inside me. So, my primary physician made me an appointment with a psychiatrist and he gave me the directions. In the university, they have this color coding system based on the primary colors. And there is a stripe that runs down the hallways of each of the departments in Duke. And if you follow that stripe, you're going to eventually land up to where you're supposed to go. So in this first appointment that I was given, I had to follow the yellow stripe. The yellow stripe took me to very good yellow brick road. It took me to the department <coughs> Psychopharmacologist. For <laughs> my, my appointment with a psychopharmacologist. <laughs> and I sat down and I started talking, and I wasn't talking more than five minutes, and all of a sudden he starts scribbling and scribbling, and he rips out these two things and puts them in front of me, and I said, What's this? And he said, I want you to take these because you seem to be very anxious. Well, that voice spoke to me. I pushed those little scripts back across to his side of the desk, and I said, no, thank you. I said, uh, I'm in the nightclub business, as you know, and when I feel anxious, I have a couple of drinks and that makes me feel better. And I'd rather do that than take any drugs. Well, I guess in that psychiatrist's background, or perhaps in North Carolina, we didn't have any alcoholics because weren't the symptoms obvious here? I'm Irish Catholic, high incidence of alcoholism. I'm in the nightclub business. Clearly on my records, my dad died of cirrhosis of the liver. Hello? <laughs> Am I an alcoholic, perhaps? Not one doctor in my journey ever suggested to me that I may have a drinking problem. When I went back to my primary physician, I told him, I said, I didn't like that particular psychiatrist. Perhaps you could suggest somebody else. He said, why didn't you like him? I said, because he wanted to give me drugs. Oh. So he made another appointment for me. This time I had to follow the blue stripe. <laughs> the blue stripe 
website took me into the Department of Behavioral Modification. And remember, I'm in the same Department of Psychiatry, going down different colored lanes. And the blue lane takes me into this room that's mauve and gray, and fern plant, plants hanging there, angel pictures on the wall, the strange noise music in the background. They brought me over to a lazy boy chair, and they said, we climb back here and relax. And they put these, uh, take me up with these wires and this little thing going on. And they said, now every time you feel anxious, just start relaxing and listen to this music. Well, I relaxed and I stopped feeling anxious. It worked. How about that? I got to be friends with one of the nurses there, and one of the things she said to me was, don't let them give you any drugs over in that yellow stripe. <laughs> you don't need any of those drugs. And then she told me that first time I heard this term, she said, so people from here have left the medical community and they started a new village just south of here where they're practicing holistic medicine. You should take a ride down there, which I did. And boy, now I'm getting massages, I'm going to steam rooms, I'm taking vitamins, nice, and I'm starting to feel better. And I stopped drinking and I'm eating better. My primary physician doesn't know what else to do with me, so he gives me a diagnosis of Chronic fatigue. Apparently, I had the same phys physiological manifestations of somebody who had a massive heart attack or was recovering from cardiac surgery. So he put me in what's called the DuPac program. And it was actually the first sports medicine program for people to recover from cardiac-related illnesses. <coughs> it was like going into Canyon Ranch or a health spa. But again, Blue Cross Blue Shield is putting the bell, so what they have. Now I'm in a I'm in health spa environment, and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm in this program for about a couple of weeks, and getting better and better, and I'm still not drinking. And one day, I go out on an outdoor track in the stadium, and I'm trying to keep up. I'm 38 years old at that point. I'm trying to keep up with this older man in his 60s, who's full, full of life and energy. He's just moving along that track. He's, talking to me while I'm sure puffing and puffing and trying to keep up with him. And then he starts to tell me a story. He said, I used to be all about business. Didn't pay attention to my family or friends or anything. He said, then something happened to me after I got out of the hospital. I took a backpack and I walked out of my business and I woke him up and I camped on top of this mountain. And he said, everybody thought I was going crazy. He said, see what happened to me is I was sitting on my desk and I had this massive heart attack. And they rushed me to the hospital. And when the ambulance pulled up in front of the emergency room, and they pulled the gurney out and started wheeling my body into, into the emergency room, he started laughing. He says, all of a sudden, I'm waving down to him, and I'm, and I'm saying, hey, I'm not there. I'm up here. I'm up here. Come on back. I'm up here. And he said, and then I went off into this bright, beautiful light. And I saw things that I still can't talk about. And he said, and I know you've been there too, haven't you? And I grabbed him by the arm. And I said, I thought I was the only crazy, crazy person in the world that had an experience like this. I'll forget, it's 1984. Your death experience was not a household term then. And certainly this crazy nightclub owner had no idea what he had experienced. So, this older man said to me, have you been to see Dr. Brown? He said, I've seen this about every doctor and psychiatrist at that point. He said, that was a medical anomaly. They really wanted to work on me and figure me out, both mentally and physiologically. So, I said, never heard of Dr. Rao. I said, go talk to that nurse over there. She'll get an appointment with Dr. Rao. So I go over to this nurse and I start babbling about having this experience where I left my body. And she goes, shh. <laughs> what is this big, big secret to do? She goes into her office, makes a phone call, comes back, and hands me directions. Dr. Rao will see you in two hours. I go on a campus bus, took me out of the Duke University Medical Center, took me across and out of the main campus of Duke University, took me over to the East Campus, and then dropped me off across the street from the East Campus. I was geographically and metaphysically, if you will, out on the fringe of the academic, medical, scientific community. And I'm standing in front of a two-story wood frame building that has a sign on it, 
Institute for Parapsychological Research, the Ryan Foundation. What am I doing here? I came to Duke for cold, scientific, medical facts. I wanted a doctor to say to me, they made a mistake in that country hospital. You did have a massive heart attack. And by the way, you might have had some crazy thoughts in your mind. Just put them away and go back to your life. That's what I wanted to hear. All right, now I'm knocking on the door of the strange building. The door opens and it's actually Crete. <laughs> actually Crete. And there's a little old lady in there. <coughs> I'm here to see Dr. Rao. Oh, of course, come in. The door creaks as I go in. I go into the study and there's a desk there. And I sit down. And on the desk is a nameplate. Dr. Ramakrishna Rao. <laughs> I zoomed in on that word Krishna. <laughs> this is some kind of cult, and you bought me a plan of a shape that chanted for donations in some airport. And I, I, I actually got up, I'm up and I got to leave now, and Dr. Rao walks in. This, of course, is due to my cultural ignorance. Dr. Rao was from India, and he knew something was wrong with him. He was a peaceful man. He sat down and asked me while I was there. So I started talking the uh, him about, well, I was in this ambulance and apparently uh, they didn't have any vital signs and I kind of left my body. I said, he boy, this is so strange. And he goes, well, that sounds familiar. He said, uh, come on, tell me more. So I used to like to shock people back in those days by things looking out of my mouth, usually with four-letter words in his first and some silly thing that I would say to shock people. This time there were no four-letter words. I said, well, then I was greeted by a friend of mine who had been killed in Vietnam. And what do you think of that? They never heard that, right? So I'm thinking. And he said, my, those men who were killed in Vietnam seem to be awfully busy. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people I interviewed who had experience like you, and they were greeted by a friend or a loved one who had been killed in Vietnam. Well, then it was off to the races. And I kept telling them all about my story, for finally there were only five minutes left of my appointment, and Dr. Rao simply said to me, the first thing that I want you to know is that you are not going crazy. What you experience is very real and true for you. Yours is different. Yours is unique, but you share the same characteristics with many other people who have experiences like these. And we call these experiences near-death experiences. First time I heard that term. And I said to him, well, why has this been kept such a big secret? And he said, because the men and women of medicine and science who are researching in this area risk their professional reputations with the American Medical Association the American Psychiatric Association, because they are delving into an area which is outside of medicine and science. It's delving into the area of the spiritual. Many asked me to take some notes. And I'm talking about the University of Virginia, University of Connecticut, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, Raymond Moody, Bruce Grayson, Kenneth Green. I'm writing all these names down. Little did I know at the time, but later on, I would meet many of these people, and I ended up working with many of these people, and I got involved myself in the death experience research. And when I left that meeting that day, I left elated. You see, Dr. Rao gave me the mystical pill that I needed. I need someone to validate this powerful experience for me. I didn't need Prozac or lithium or any other psychopharmacological drug. All I needed were his healing words to validate. Yes, indeed, I did have this experience. But you know what? I wasn't finished. I was still an alcoholic. And what happened was, I started to drink again. And for the next several weeks, while I was drinking, and could not get drunk, could not pass out, to stay sober and drinking, which is another unique experience for me. I was having conversations with God during this period. I wish I probably write that term, conversation. <laughs> These were actually one-way debates with God. And this is how the one-way debate with God went. This crazy man, as I'm walking around on the campus and driving around, or when I flew back home, my friends thought that I really lost my mind at this point. 
because I would mumble when I talk about it and I would have conversations with God. And this is the one way to debate. If you allow me to drink like a gentleman and enjoy it, I'll do anything you want me to do. That's the deal. And I kept doing this over and over and over again, this one-way debate, and again, this is what we call insanity. And after I'd been carrying on these one-way conversations in my mind, babbling like an idiot while I'm walking along, I was finally on my way back to Duke from New York, and I changed planes in Washington, D.C., decided to get off the plane, because I had friends who were bartenders in Washington, and I was thirsty. So I got off the plane, and I started going from bar to bar in Georgetown. And I'm still having these conversations with God. And no matter how much I drank beer at the time, I still stayed sober. And finally that evening, I was in Devitt's Grill, one of my favorite haunts, about two blocks from the White House. It was during happy hour, and I'm standing at the bar, shoulder to shoulder, very fat bar. And out of my frustration, I ordered an Irish Miss, and I figured, now I'm really going to get drunk. And I picked up that Irish Miss, and I took a sip and I put it down. And as the glass was going down, I heard the voice of God say, that will be your last drink. And it was. And I looked into the mirror across that bar, and what I saw was an x-ray vision of a lost soul. I saw what I had become for the last 20 years that I had been drinking. First 18 years of my life, when I grew up at my grandmother's home, I knew I was spirit and body. I knew I was a spiritual being. But as soon as I began to drink, I replaced that spiritual being that I am with the spirits from the bottle. And that's how my life was lived for the next 20 years. But as I looked into that mirror, I realized that I had lost my spiritual self during that 20-year period. And now I realized that God was allowing me, showing me how to get it back. And I walked out of that bar, again, it's nighttime, chilly, it's in November in Washington, and I began to walk across the mall. Of course, I was walking across the mall at night, something you weren't supposed to be doing in Washington. But at that time, I was without fear. I had no fear of anything. I didn't fear death. I didn't even fear being mugged in Washington. And as I'm walking along now, I started to make peace with God. And now I was more asking questions about what, what is it that you really want me to do? What am I supposed to do? What is this mission you're giving me? Why do you give this experience to the politicians and the power brokers in this town? If they all had an experience like I had, then we would have a wonderful new world and you wouldn't need me. But he was asking me to do something and I wasn't quite sure. So I had this big question on my mind and as this big question was on my mind, I came over the snow and I'm looking down on the Vietnam Wall, the Vietnam War Memorial. And I walked down to that wall. Now, I had been there several times before. I was drawn there by my friend. And each time that I went there, I stood at that wall and I cried. See, now I knew how to cry with tears. And this night, I put my hand up in that wall with my friend's name. And as I did so, I felt my body slip and my spirit soared. And I soared again into this loving light, but into this powerful place and this powerful light. And I had this knowingness that I was in the presence of St. Michael the Archangel. And I was to learn everything it was that God was expecting me to do. And during this experience, I received a message from St. Michael the Archangel, a message which is word for word in my book, as well as on my website, as well as on flyers that I give away for free. Although it's copyrighted as part of the book, you have my permission to release it to whoever you can, because it's the most important message in the book. And that message is a dire prediction to the people of the United States of America to return to God to avoid disastrous consequences like we had on 911. And during that experience, I saw many more visions of the future. Things that were frightening made me very uncomfortable and were very connected and very linked to the visions that I had seen on the night of July 2nd. And when that experience ended, I found myself floating down, and I'm looking down, and I see a gurney in front of the wall, 
and EMTs working on my physical body. And all of a sudden, I floated down into my body very quietly and very peacefully this time. And I woke up the next morning in George Washington University Hospital, again without a diagnosis to explain why I had been in respiratory and cardiac arrest when they found me at the wall. But a miracle happened when I came to that hospital because that craving that I had inside of me from the time that I was five years old miraculously vanished. During that experience, I've been cured of my active alcoholism. And I say active alcoholism because as long as I am wearing this gorilla suit in this life, I will continue to be an alcoholic until the day that I pass on. Now, for the next 10 years, I had to recover mentally, physically, emotionally, and psychologically from these experiences that I had. And first, by my involvement in Alcoholics Anonymous, that helped a lot in my recovery. For the first three years, I actually recovered alone before I went to my, before I became involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I don't, I don't suggest that for anyone to do. You see, I had become so, so fearful and distrusting of any kind of establishment, medical or otherwise. But I recovered on my own. And when I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew. But they didn't really know what they were talking about, what they were doing, because they had implemented the same plan of recovery that I had been given during that second experience, with the exception of the fact that I was doing it alone. And that's why I was drawn to AA, and why my real recovery began when I became involved in AA. Now, at this period of time, I already sold the nightclub in Florida. I still owned the club in the Hamptons. And I couldn't extract myself from it. It was too integrated into the building that I then owned, that had my real estate businesses. But I could no longer tolerate being in a nightclub environment, so I became an absentee owner. <coughs> and I knew that at some future point, if indeed I was given a mission in my life, the future events were going to happen. And they started happening as early as 1987. And at first, they were rather inconsequential events that I had been shown, but again, it was a connection. It was a quickening going on in my life. On the morning of April 7th, 1991, my son Michael Christopher was born. I was in the delivery room when he was born. And just as he came out of his mother's womb, his spiritual energy just flowed and soared around that room. What an incredible experience that birth him. And I heard the voice of the lady of light saying, truly he is the son of God. And it was at that very moment that I realized one of the most important lessons that I had been shown on July 2nd, 1984, and that was of the sanctity of life. Now in the fall of 1994, I was drawn to this outdoor wooden shrine in the hillside of Eastern Long Island very close to my home, a place I was never aware of before. And the way it happened was, I kept searching through these hills for a clearing to look out over the Atlantic Ocean, because I had been shown future scenes from this clearing. And in one incredible scene, I saw a tremendous tidal wave of the future that would actually wash across that area and destroy everything before it. So this day, as I was driving up this two-lane road looking for the highest point in this hillside, in this hillside all of a sudden I see a sign that says, Our Lady of the Island Shrine. And the car went like this, and right up that drive. And I went up and I parked in the lot. And I went on a trail. And on this trail I realized it's going to get me to the highest point in this wooded outdoor shrine here. And when I got up there and walked out, indeed I walked out, and there's the clearing. Looking out over the Atlantic Ocean in the distance, just like I did 10 years before when I was clinically dead in that ambulance. But the most profound part of that clearing was that right behind me there was a 300 ton granite boulder. And on top of that granite boulder was an 18 foot statue of the Virgin Mary. And I knew that this shrine was very important 
for future events in my life. And I started going back there regularly. Every morning I would go back there and I'd walk through these trails in the woods where they had the stations of the cross and the rosary walk. And I knew there was a quickening going on inside of me. And about two weeks later, I went there the Sunday morning and up by the area where we call the rock, there was a large lawn area. And when I went up there, there was a Catholic priest there by the name of Father Peter McCall, a famous human priest. And there were hundreds of people lined up, and he would walk up to them, he would anoint their foreheads with oil, and the people would faint back on the lawn, caught by others, and the people would begin to pray over them. And they were like dominoes. They'd slain in the spirit, laying down on the lawn. And I was absolutely mesmerized. I had no idea that this kind of healing was going on in Catholic services. I had seen it on TV, Ben Kinn and other televangelists doing healings. I'm thinking, whoa, 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 what is this all about? And I sat on the bench and watched this for well over an hour as hundreds of people were slain in the spirit. I had no intention of participating. And all of a sudden, I felt this force pick me up. Next thing I know, I'm standing up there. I'm almost at the end of the line. Before I know a father who calls up there and he points me with oil and I went back. And I felt that I was back in that loving light of God and laying on the lawn with my eyes shut and I wanted to stay there. And several women began to pray over me. One on the left was praying in tongues. Whoa, what's this all about? The one on the right, I would later learn, had a near-death experience three years before when she nearly bled to death during an operation. The woman who previously had led a very colorful life. But after she recovered from this operation, she went home and she began to get messages from the Virgin Mary. And at this point, three years later, she had written three books of messages that she would receive on a daily basis. And this woman who is now praying over me says, I'm getting a message for you. I don't know why I'm being asked to give you this message, but I'm told that you will understand. And this woman who did not know me said, Ned, you have been wrestling inward for a long time now. You have known for a long time now that you have a decision to make.
On December 8, 1994, I went back to that shrine early in the morning. And I went up by the rock and I began to pray and meditate. And I was very stubborn and very determined. It was like trying to make a long distance phone call in Mexico and just not getting through. But I wanted more validation. I want more, more something to give me the confidence to move on. Because you see, for what I had been shown, I was to leave the home that I love in West Hampton. I was to leave my businesses, and my life was to change. I had just taken up golf. I was addicted to the game, and I didn't want to give it up. So I was being asked to give up a lot, to take up whatever the solution was. So I really needed something more. And it was a chilly, bright, sunny day, and after about an hour of prayer, my knees were getting really sore. I got up, and I decided, Maybe it is a time, or maybe this is really happening. And I began to walk down the trail behind the rock where the statue is. And as I did so, I looked up, and there was a large pine tree that all of a sudden I thought was engulfed in flames. And I'm looking up now, I'm just standing there mesmerized, and I realize that there's this large oval flame in this pine tree. And all of a sudden, it begins to float down the hillside, and all of a sudden, onto the
first thing I did was I bought a pamphlet in English. And why I bought that pamphlet was, as you look at the front cover, what you see is an act of supernatural visitation of the Virgin Mary over the dome of St. Mary's Church back in 1968. The visitation very similar to the way she appeared to me at the East Port Shrine on December 8, 1994. And I started reading through this pamphlet. And what I read was that indeed the Virgin Mary appeared to thousands of people on many different nights, including Muslims, Christians, Jews, hello, the message during the Israeli Egyptian War. When she was appearing on many different nights, she was to sign the peace. And as I read on, I read that not but she appeared sometimes by balls of golden light. Familiar? Until I read in the very next page that the Egyptian Coptic established a feast day in honor of her appearances. Feast day celebrated starting on April 2nd, 1969. And that feast day in the Egyptian Coptic is the Feast of the Lady of Light. And that is the first time that I heard that term of endearment from any other source than my own experience on the night of July 2nd, 1984. And when that, that was what sealed the covenant for me. It sealed the covenant for me back 5,600 miles to my materialistic home in my hands and put everything up for sale because I knew I was moving on. And I began to write. And the way the process happened was after about two weeks of praying and meditating when I went to sleep at night in my room, finally one morning around 4 a.m. I woke up, I sat down at my desk, the old pad was already there with my pen, so I picked up a pen and I began to write. Around 8 o'clock that morning, the pen dropped down and I got up and I went to the shrine. I went to the shrine and prayed for the sermon that what I was receiving was through the Holy Spirit. And that's how the process started. I went every morning at 4 a.m. and I began to write. At 8 or 8 30, writing the song. I wrote much of what would become the manuscript for the sermon and the other writings that are still waiting to be published. And by May of 1996, pretty much put this manuscript together. I had a buyer for my home, a neighbor. I had buyers for real estate business and in my club. And I knew my life was going to change, but I decided it was going to change my terms. My account figured out that when I had all these sales go through, I got about $2.2 million that I could put into a mutual fund and therefore receive a passive income would allow me to continue the lifestyle to which I had a custom and still do whatever that God was asking me to do. That was my plan. <laughs> Two nights before I was in West Hampton Beach, sold and for the title to be transferred at about 4.20 in the morning. 20 minutes after the club was closed and locked up in a municipal parking lot across the street from the a young black man into a coma by four thugs from New York City. When I woke up the next morning, I right at 4 a.m., and right at 8 a.m., right stopped because the phone rang, and I got the terrible news of what happened, and I drove down to the building the parking lot. It was a crime that police cars full of blood around the taped area. When I heard the circumstances, the man had been in the club, so apparently were these other men, my own security people, had gotten a license for the vehicle that they escaped in. So when I left the parking lot that morning, I had no reason to believe that this was the transfer of the liquor license because nothing had happened in the club. So now I'm going to for this young man for his recovery. Several days later, I get a call from a friend who worked at the New 
York Daily News, we said the New York City narcotics detective was just arrested for the beating of this young man, and everybody in the media in New York City is on their way out to West Hampton. And by the time I got down to that same parking lot across the street from my club, every major network, including CNN, satellite, TV trucks from European stations, were all camped out in that parking lot. The talking heads were standing there with a the microphone, and behind them is the entrance to Club America. And this became an international news incident. It was right after the Rodney King event. So they saw something else that became important because of the New York City narcotics detective. Right after that, several other men were arrested, and they weren't policemen, but they were involved in organized crime. As a result of this media circus, Governor Pataki directed the state liquor authority not to transfer the liquor license to the new owners. And at that point, we were already in the club, getting ready to open the club. My lawyer said to me, we're going to have to file in the court to get the liquor license back. We'll get it back, but it's going to be back in your name, and you're going to have to go back in there and run the club yourself. And now I had a decision to make. Because I get up at 4 a.m. and plan a legal strategy and give up that spiritual gift that I've been given. You see, a little smile on my face as I talk to him, I already knew all those things were going to be taken away from me. I knew I was facing certain financial bankruptcy if I didn't do what they told me to do. But on the other hand, I had been spiritually bankrupt for 20 years. So I kept getting up every morning, writing, and going to the shrine. The club never did reopen. It sits there ready to this day. I lost my deal selling my real estate business. I finally sold my home to my same neighbor. But he held out for much longer and less of price. And finally, I did finally have to declare personal bankruptcy. But you see, I was freed up from all those material possessions because God didn't want me to go on with bad money. With the mission, I knew the mission in life. I of all those materialistic possessions is such an important part of my life. He who dies with the most toys wins. Now my motto is, he who dies with the most toys is in for a really big surprise. <laughs> because even going back several thousand years, I learned in Egypt, even the Egyptian pharaohs did not take all that wealth that they buried with themselves to the next world. All that materialism, all those important things in this world. See, What has meaning to me now is what I was showing on the other side. The most important lesson I learned, learned on the other side is that we do not die ever. When God created us, He created us as loving spiritual beings in His image and likeness. From the Bible, from my experience, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. We all come into this world with a mission in life. We have a free will. We make decisions. Sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. When we send out positive energy, we send it out because of good deeds, the loving deeds that we do. We send out positive energy into the spiritual atmosphere around the world. When we send out negative energy, we send it out through simple things, like even the profanity. The use of the F word, which is so popular in these days. Every time that word is used, it sends out negative energy into the world. And think about all the other terrible things that we do to each other, do to mankind, do to the earth, that sends out that negative energy. And that negative energy, when it builds up, it becomes storms. Spiritual storms, if you will. And when those storms become very overbearing and over powerful, it creates storms like a storm of hatred that's existed in the Middle East for so many years. And the storms like this in 911, in the World Trade Center, and in Washington, in Pennsylvania. And how do we change that spiritual atmosphere? We have to change it through the power of prayer, by forming prayer groups around the world. The most important thing for us now is to love ourselves, 
Love God, most importantly, love our neighbor, and to be of service to mankind. The most important lesson that I learned on the other side is the importance of bringing children into this world. You see, our children, our future children, are actually our spiritual brothers and sisters who are waiting in God's world, in His realm, to be born into this world. I'm a dad to two boys now, Michael and Jacob. They're both 10 years old, and they're the joy of my life. As we have seen more clearly now since 9-1-1, indeed we are in the end times. These children are meant to be born out all in the 101st Airborne, because they are really the ones who are going to rescue this world. They are the ones who are coming in this world with the messages of love from God, that are going to help transform this world between now and as I was shown in the year 2034. But so we will indeed be living in a world of peace, a world that is more like heaven on earth. And thank you for listening to my story. The reason I want to talk to you is because I'm not asking for donations right now. I want to tell you what the Mission of Angels Foundation is about. I was shown this Mission of Angels Foundation. I was given the statement of goals during that experience. And since my book has come out, and I've been going back up to Pennsylvania, I've had people coming up to me at book signings, people sending me emails or calling me and saying they read my book and they resonated with the Mission of Angels Foundation. And I a long time ago that I'm just a little piece of this puzzle and now all the other pieces of that puzzle are being put into place and ultimately the Mission of Angels Foundation will be a spiritually based community in a mountain valley area called Sugarloaf in northeastern Pennsylvania and it will be a community that will be built around a spiritual retreat center we have at this point the virtual reality of how to design that retreat center and in that center, we will be integrating spiritual healing arts along with the disciplines of medicine and science. And I've had doctors, several doctors, email me and call me and say that they have been thinking about the same concept and read my book or went to my website and saw what the plans were, what the visions were for the area. They knew that they were meant to connect. So this is all very exciting that's happening out there right now. And one of the sequel books I'm going to write to Fascinating the Heaven will be Mission of Angels. And it will be telling the ongoing story of the miraculous coincidences, if you will, of how everybody's being put into place that will become part of this community. Now, one thing that I'm going to ask you to do after you leave here is consider one of the activities that we're involved in right now, and it's called the Benefit Fund for the Children Left Behind. Now, what we decided to do in our communities in northeastern Pennsylvania and in New York, where there are a number of, in particular, policemen and firemen who lost their lives and we still have children there, we decided that, very similar to the work we were doing before, work similar to the Sunshine Foundation or the Wish Foundation, that we were going to arrange vacation packages to Disney World for the children of the firemen, the policemen, and the EMS workers who were killed during the 9 11 attacks. And now we're expanding that program to include all children who lost their parents as a result of those terrorist attacks. And the way I arrived at doing that is because I started getting emails from communities, from schools, and from businesses around the country that wanted to sponsor one of these families. And what we're doing as the foundation, we have donation containers and posters that we send to each one of these groups. And it would be up to your group to put these posters up in places of business in your community or your school or your business firms and the donation containers. And then all of the monies that you collect, 100% of those monies go into a savings account, and 100% of those funds go 
to pay for a vacation trip for one of the particular families that you would sponsor. So I would ask you to think about this for your own community, your own business, or your own school. Think about sponsoring one of these families and sending them on vacation. You know, there, all of these families are being well funded in terms of food, clothing, shelter, and schooling for these kids. But we're doing something special. They're going to get a knock on the door one day, and these children are going to be invited to go to Disney World, which is a dream come true for these children. We can't bring back the mom or the dad, but we can create a little miracle in the life, and we call it our motto is to make miracles happen. So I would just like to leave you with that thought, okay? Now the envelopes and the donation cards that I passed out, that's where if you want to be included, uh, to receive our, e our email newsletter or our newsletter in the mail, please fill out that card and leave it for me. Okay? And now, any questions? I used up all our time. This is 5 o'clock. Yes. Anybody I'll be in the back to sign books if anybody does have a question.